just wanted to say thank you for everyone on the panel to um, for being here and for taking time out of your day and your vacation uh, from the Caribbean to be here. And I was hoping that um, we could all introduce ourselves so that the attendees know who uh, are on the panel and I'm sure they already know most of you from the Facebook group and so I was um, going to ask if Melissa if you would like to go first. Sure. Uh, would you like a brief bio or do you just are you just looking for my name? Like name, your specialty, how long you've been practicing, are you an owner or associate? Yeah, so I'm Melissa Wages and I'm a pediatric dentist. Um, I finished my residency in 2015. So I had about 10 years prior to that as a general dentist where I worked with the Indian Health Service. And um, I'm in Portland, Oregon. I currently own a practice and I work also in corporate dentistry. Great, thank you so much. And then we'll go to Dr. Leslie. Hi, um, I'm Leslie Butler. I graduated in oh my goodness, uh, 2009 on pediatrics. So, 2007 from dental school, 2008 from pediatrics. I am actually still an associate. I've been an associate in the same practice with the same owner for 10 years now. And I have been an owner for six years. I have two associates and I just opened a second practice. So, Congratulations. Yeah. Got a lot on your plate. <laughs> All right, um, Dr. Nada. I'm Nada Albatish. I am from Ontario, Canada. I'm willing to bet I'm the only Canadian here. Um, I graduated in 2007. Um, I'm a GP. I did my GPR the year after. I'm an owner. I have eight associates um, and, and I do comprehensive dentistry. And, and we'll talk about that. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Mapp. Um, I believe I was, I had seven jobs in eight years, um, starting in 1994, so I know a lot about being an associate. I have owned two practices, and I have hired five associates over the years, so I think I know both sides of the coin. Great, yeah, yeah, I, I'm sure. It sounds like we've got a lot of different experiences here, so this is going to be great. And Dr. Gigi? Hi, I'm Gigi Peralkar. Um, I'm Gigi Fleming on the Facebook group. Um, but uh, I'm an orthodontist. I graduated from residency in um, 2014. And um, I'm an associate and I'm an owner. I just uh, opened up my startup practice a little over a year ago in northern New Jersey. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Um, we have Linty John Marquise who wants to say hi. Hi, Linty. <laughs> um, so, okay, we'll get started. I think um, if any of the attendees have a question, please feel free to uh, jump on. But I'm going to start with one. The one question being, what things should a new associate prepare for when transitioning from associate or associateship to ownership? Um, is there anyone who wants to take that first question? Anyone? Okay, I'll go. Okay. Um, because I just did it. Um, I think if you're starting out, like you've recently graduated and um, you're an associate, I think it's important to try and observe what the systems are in place in your current practice. I think when you're jumping from associate to owner, that's one of the things that's... Um, you may not have insight into unless you're really paying attention to it. So kind of focusing on, you know, the different duties that staff have, maybe um, getting familiar with if it's an insurance-based practice, if you think you're going to open an insurance-based practice, how does that work? Um, because there's a lot more outside of just doing the dentistry. There's also running an office. You know, so really trying to position yourself in the owner's shoes before you try on that role is important. But then also trying to do your homework in terms of what is it going to take for you to either purchase an existing practice or do a startup. You know, that, that's a lot of homework that gets done too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really good advice. Um, anybody else want to jump in? Well, I think one thing she said was to pay attention as an associate because a lot of times associates, if you're not planning on transi transitioning into ownership, you think, oh, I'm just gonna go to work and then I'm gonna go back home and I don't have to worry about the business. 
But if you want to be an owner, you really have to understand what that business entails because you'll be, you'll be spending more time actually mm -hmm. on the business side than the dentistry when you start out. And if you don't understand numbers, you're just going to really struggle a lot more at the beginning than people that understand numbers. Very true. Um, I definitely agree with that, especially when you're a new owner uh, and you have to spend a lot more time. Like I remember going into the office like seven in the morning and I wouldn't leave until like nine o'clock at night. So I definitely remember those days. Um, I was going to go into the second question. How should an associate interact with staff or team? And what is their role in management, if any? I'll, I'll take that oh, one. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> no, go ahead, Leslie. You can go first. No, no, it's fine. You're up. Go for it. I think you're on the screen. Oh, I am? Okay. I'm like, yeah. you're on my screen, so I don't know how it goes. <laughs> oh, um, I... <laughs> When I first started out, I felt like I had to be really involved with it, with all of the team members because I really wanted, when I was an associate, because I wanted everybody to really like me. So I would take them to lunches and I would spoil them and do all this. And my owner doctor had to pull me aside and talk with me because it started causing a little bit of discourse in the practice. And I know this sounds really weird and it's something I'm dealing with too, but it's, um, they're, they're in a debate. Be, there ended up being like, oh, well, we can't wait till Dr. Butler comes and works and da, 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 because I would take them to lunch and I would scold them and I would take them to go do things. And he wouldn't necessarily do that. And so he had to sit me down and say, listen, you're not, you don't own this practice. Like you're, you're my associate and da, 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 da. And I'm like, okay, I get that. And he's like, you don't have to do these things. That's, it's not your role to do that. You're not the owner doctor. Um, you're coming into work and then you're leaving. You don't have any responsibilities here. And my team, my associates love my team members here. And one of them in particular loves to spoil the team members. And it's getting to the point where I'm having that conversation probably with her next week. And it's not a big deal. It's not, nobody's in trouble or anything. It's just explaining the same situation I went through because she was, I, she's a newer associate. I was a newer associate. And it's just explaining the different role in that they, it's like a respect level because you don't want them to start, you know, disrespecting you and favoring the associates. And they're, they always have to remember that I know it's, I hate saying this, but I am the boss and I do write their paychecks and the associate, I like them to have a role. I don't, I don't, I don't undermine my associates at all. I'm actually not in the office when they're here. They work on the patients. I don't dictate their treatment plans. They're in full control of their patients, their treatment plans, everything. I do not undermine anything that they do. I feel that micromanaging an associate is one of the worst things you can do. Um, that they're specialists just like me. They went to school just like me. I need to respect what they do as dentists and specialists. I just need to talk to her from a owner point of view that she just needs to understand, you know, the balance between being an owner and an associate on, you don't have to spoil them. You don't have to take them out. They're, they're doing their jobs. You don't have to constantly be bringing them stuff every morning you work just to thank them for the day. And, and the other thing is like the one thing I've noticed that I talked to my manager tonight. Some of you saw her before I started, but um, we were just talking because there isn't a respect level with her that they have with me. They also, they treat her more like a, a friend and an equal and not as a doctor because she's now on a friend level with them because she's constantly going out to lunch with them and hanging out with them. And that's fine. But now there, she doesn't have, um, she doesn't have the authority over them. So when she says something, it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, maybe we'll get to that. It's not like, oh, she said this, I need to do it now. So she's lost her sense of authority with them. Well, my other associate doesn't. She says something, they jump. And that, that's where I found that they lost the transition. So when I stopped treating my team at the other office I worked at where I was an associate, where I am an associate, I stopped treating them as friends and treating them like I was a doctor and they were there to help me. Um, I found that it, it transitioned a lot better. So if I asked them to do something or I asked them to change my schedule or move this patient, it was done. It wasn't like, oh, well, I don't know about that, you know, or, hey, we did this. It's just, a, it, to me, that's a really big, it's a hard balance to have. And I had a really hard time with it in the beginning. And now I'm, 
it, it's, it's something that I now have to address in my practice where one of my associates has been great with it. The other one is now crossing that friend boundary. And so that's a conversation we're going to be having just because I want to help her. I want her to be able to know that she has a sense of authority with the team and they need to respect her and she needs to get off that friend level with them. And that's, that's my two cents on it. Cause I struggled with that when I started and now I want to help her. So we can get past that here at my office. So we shall see. Great example. Great. Dr. Nada. Okay. So in my practice, it's, I run it very business. So the systems in the clinic are really important to me. So for my associates, I mean, the, the one thing when they come in, when they're first new is I want them to train their assistant to work with them. I consider that to be the associate's responsibility. And it's not because the team members are not trained. Everybody in my practice is trained and they're all awesome, but every doctor works differently. So the associate has to be willing to communicate with their assistant so that they can actually deliver you know, the product, the service, the communication that they want to their patients. Um, so that's one thing. And that's something that with some associates I've found can be a hurdle. Um, and with others, they're really great at communicating with the team. And so they, they just easily kind of get into that role of training their assistant, having that flow in their operatory. Um, the people who don't do so well with that, I find will come to me and say, I need you to train this assistant. And I'm like, you know, the assistant is like really, really well trained. They know all the systems, all the processes. And when they work with me, I don't have to do post-op instructions. Um, they're communicating codes to the front desk. Like everything's moving like clockwork. But those are like when I'm like my, my, my deal is if you work with me, you need to be one step ahead. So my assistant knows my flow. So for the associates, like you have to train your assistant to be able to do that for you. Um, and then outside of the clinical, um, I don't expect anything from my associates as far as management or anything on the business end. And most people that are associating, they don't want that anyway. Um, so I have zero expectations on that front. But the one thing I ask is if they see something that's a problem and they know, they know it, they see a behavior that's an issue or maybe an interaction with a patient that wasn't ideal, and you know, everybody knows, like we, we all, I don't know, I think we all know how to communicate with patients. We all know what goes well and what doesn't. Um, and if they see that, the one thing I ask is for them to come forward and let me know, because as I, you know, if you're an owner and especially if you're not there the whole week and the associates are there days that you're not, everyone's gonna see different sides of the practice and different things. So I would consider that the associate's responsibility just to kind of raise the red flag and say, hey, we need some attention you know, to this, um, just to make sure that things are not flying below the radar. So those are, those are kind of my, my two cents on that. Great, thank you. Um, so can I add to that super quick? Yes, absolutely. So I think uh, absolutely what you said. Um, when I'm working in, at the corporations, I work at many different sites. So I might work at five or six different clinics in a month, which is with five or six different teams of employees. And I need to be able to communicate clearly and directly with all those staff members, whether it's you know five new assistants that month or 10 even, and be able to give them specific direction. So in that role, you almost feel like you're a supervisor but that can't be grayed. That, that line can't be grayed because you're not going to be the one to write them up or to give them a ding. Um, and so, but, but at the same time, you need to be able to be clear and communicate. Um, and then the other thing that I would add too is that, you know, uh, Leslie mentioned going to lunch and that type of thing, which, you know, some daytime activities are important for team building and that type of thing. Um, but I, I draw the line at evenings. So um, I think any evening activities are, you know, pretty much inappropriate. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out for drinks or go hang, go to happy hour, that kind of thing with any of the staff member, but that might be more of a personal um, sort of boundary that I have and where I draw the line but um, it could be you know that that could be something that in an occasion is appropriate the holidays for instance so understood um, there is a question from uh, someone that's an attendee and Tanya asks the question if your associate feels there's something wrong and is trying hard to let you know 
um, that the associate can help you if they see they can. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read, read what she wrote. Do you think it's okay for the associate to let you know the problem and help or back off? Um, this I, happen? We had this happen in my practice about a year ago. And um, the, for some reason, my team members were going to my associate with a problem. And so she actually came to me and called me at night and said, hey, can we talk? And she went over the whole situation with me. Mm -hmm. And what I did, because I, again, she, she's my associate. She's not the owner. She doesn't, she's not in charge here. And obviously they felt comfortable coming to her. So we discussed it. And then um, I told her, you know, if something happens, I, I appreciate her coming to me. So we talked to that employee together for the first time it happened um, because it's the only time it's ever happened where they went to her instead of me. And we addressed it together with that employee um, and the other employee. And then after that, I actually had a team meeting later on where my associate wasn't present. Every time we have team meetings, my associates are always welcome, but they work at other locations. So if they can't be there, they're not always there. But um, we, I addressed my entire team at that point and just said, listen, my associates, Dr. Gloria and Dr. Meshi, they're not, I said, they, they're not here to solve your problems. They're not the owner doctor. Um, and I said, if you guys have a problem or something isn't working for you or you're having a problem with another employee or something isn't feeling right, I really want you to come and talk to me. You guys can text me. They literally will call me at one in the morning. I, I really, I'd rather them text me to get something off their chest than to bring the problems into work and create more, more issues. So after that, it's never been an issue. It happened one time in the three years I've had an associate. Originally, since they went to her, like I said, we addressed it together, the three of us. And then after that, I addressed the whole team and asked them to please come to me. And since that point, they've all come to me and it hasn't been an issue. And my associate was relieved when I did that because she didn't want to deal with the problems. She, she felt very uncomfortable doing it. She didn't want to get involved. And, I, and then that's the, where I'm an associate. We have the same policy there as well. I don't get in fact I don't get involved with employees with any of the anything that happens between employees anything that they have complaints about front office back office I said I have no problem if you guys want to talk to me I have no problem relaying something to him but I said he would prefer that you talk to him or reach out to the manager if you guys have an issue and not address me and they were like okay and um, that worked really great at my practice but everybody's a little different anybody else yeah, I was going to say, I agree completely. I think letting the owner know that there's a problem, but backing off of giving a solution because there are so many different solutions to any, anything and you don't know that you're going to really jive with the owner's perspective. And sometimes business decisions are not, um, what, they're not emotion based and they're not, you know, based on what feels good. Sometimes it has to be based on numbers and it might be the opposite of what you think. Um, so I think the best thing to do is to just bring it to the owner's attention um, and, and kind of step away from solving it. Great. Um, great. Thank you. I think Tanya has another question. Um, I think she's still in the middle of typing it. So once she's done typing, we'll get back to it. But I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, what things as an owner do you want your associates to know? Mm -hmm. So many. Um, I'll start. <laughs> um, for me, I would like my associates to really know the numbers, just like if they were an owner. I don't think you should sh keep it a secret because I think it's helpful for them to know, understand the way the business works. And I think if they I know one mistake I made as an associate is you look at your own numbers of your production and you think, oh gosh, this owner is making so much money off of all my work. And then when you become an owner, you say, oh gosh, well, there's a lot less money available because you're not getting all that money. And I don't think as an associate, when you're first starting out, until you start learning the business, you, you don't understand that. Um, so I think as an owner, I want I actually sit down with my associates and I say, look, this is our, this is the way we budget. This is, a, this is how much we have for supplies. This is how much we have for um, advertising. And I, and I, and I give them the, the ideal percentages so that they, they can kind of start understanding what it takes to run a business. Right. I'm so glad you said that because honestly, I would never have been prepared for ownership if my owner doctor, where I 
where I associate, he was so open with sharing all that information with me for the five years before I opened my practice. He would run the numbers with me. He would show me Excel spreadsheets. He would show me reports. He would show me that stuff. And so when I, I feel like when you jump into ownership, it's almost like you're jumping in the deep end and it's sink or swim. And I felt so much more prepared because he was so open to sharing that stuff with me. And so even now, like if I have questions, I can still message him and text him. And he's very open to sharing what he, what he would do and his thoughts. And I love that you do that. I, I'm happy to do that with my associates as well, because it's giving them also some training. So if they do want to open their own practices, you're giving them the groundwork so they could do that successfully. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's if the associate wants to. I feel like some associates don't, they just want to show up, work, get a paycheck and go. And they are happy being an associate and, you know, they don't really want to know the overhead and, and financials. Um, so I've seen kind of both sides myself. Um, so I have a question from, I believe it's Al Aline. Um, what if your owner doctor is not so open about those numbers? Gigi. I, <laughs> she had this like look on her face like she was gonna be like oh uh, you know I mean I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that that's a red flag but I think that it's important to kind of know the overall numbers and then also know what you're contributing to the practice so that you understand the lay of the land and and if there isn't that transparency you got to wonder why and there may be reasons but you know, I didn't have that experience. I was lucky in the sense that, um, you know, the owner that I work for wanted me to know everything, wanted me to see what we were collecting every day, wanted me to see what we were producing every day, and wanted me to pay attention to accounts receivable and all that stuff. So I think, I think if you don't have the opportunity to get it in your current situation, you may want to try and rely on friends of yours who maybe have that experience. You can at least create a framework for yourself because really what you need is you need some references, right? To know what's normal, not normal for the area that you're in or where you want to practice or all, you know, ultimately be an owner. Um, so I'm sorry, Grace, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Well, I think I didn't have access to any of that. I just didn't have that luxury. Um, the practice that I ended up buying became available and it was a quick scramble to, I, I had no intention of going into practice ownership. Um, so I didn't have that background. I didn't have that mindset uh, and I hadn't done any of my research ahead of time. So that said, it's not a deal breaker if you don't have that information. I think the small business is the backbone of our American economy. And there's a lot of, like most small businesses aren't run by business minded people. You don't open a yarn store because you want to own a business. You open a yarn store because you love yarn or knitting or something. So and ours just happens to be dentistry. So I think that if you don't have that the background, that doesn't mean that you can't learn it and you can't get there. And I think that relying on your friends, um, possibly colleagues is, is a great alternative if you can't get it from your own place of business. And I'd like to add to that what I do think um, is a red flag. I love everything you just said, Melissa. What I do think is a red flag is if they won't let you see your own numbers. Um, but for you to have access to the entire practice's numbers, depending on what's happening in that practice, the owner may or may not think that that's appropriate. To me, I'm very open book in my practice with each dentist and my team will give the information to each dentist on their own production, on payroll, they get their own production and their own collections. But I don't really freely give out the practice numbers, the entire practice numbers like that. And in every associateship that I've had before I was an owner, I didn't have access to that. So that's probably where I learned that that's what the norm is where I am. Um, and that was perfectly fine for me. I did work in one place where, they, where I couldn't even see my own numbers and that was kind of weird. And so I was out of there. Um, and so that's what I would consider to be a red flag. Like you should be able to check everything you've done in a day, in a week, in a month. Um, and you should be able to see that nothing's been changed. And I don't know, I just feel like that comes with ethics, kind of an open book on what you're doing. Um, but for like in my practice, I've got eight associates. I have a good, at least half of them who have zero interest in the business, zero. Like they're associating because they do not want to own. So I would never even think to sit down and do that with them. 
Um, one more question. If your associate is feeling targeted wrongfully by an old staff member, the staff, those staff members that tell you the practice will sink if they leave, if the associate feels targeted by this person in a way that is being set for failure because they want the associate out of the office, what would be the best way to deal with this situation from the owner's point of view? So that you're saying that the that the associate feels an employee is targeting them to get rid of them? I think that's what the question is. Um, I'm just that actually to... happened in my practice, but my <laughs> staff was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I fired the associate. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I wasn't really 100% sure about that yeah. question. Um, so fair enough. I think in uh, corporate dentistry, there's uh, just the nature of the beast. There's a lot of turnover. And sometimes it is, sometimes the concerns are warranted. And so I think um, as an owner, listening to your staff uh, is, is a, you know, definitely a viable option, hearing their concerns, kind of keeping your ears and eyes open. Um, but at the same time, ultimately, you know, it may come down to a reprimand for the staff member. I mean, that's, that situation can be as unique as every uh, assistant and dentist, um, you know, interaction relationship. So there's times that it could go either way. I can definitely see that. Perfect. Um, Sarah Thomas would like to know, I'm headed, hold on, where to go? I'm headed into ownership and feel rather clueless. I have a good mentor slash partner but what are the biggest pieces of advice for diving in head first? Clearly a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> get, a, get a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> I had a consultant to help me with my startup, but I also made a board um, that consisted of a couple people that I trusted that I could go to with questions that ran successful businesses. And I don't think everybody does this, but I wanted to be successful. So I actually made a board where I had to go to for any large thing. So if I wanted to purchase something large or I wanted to bring a consultant on or something, I had to present my case and it had to get approved. And they were just there to basically see the positive and negatives of everything. Not one of them on there was a dentist. They were people who have done really well in business, ran $50 million companies, just people that I knew that I really trusted for the business sense. I know that sounds really weird and awkward, but I wanted to make sure that opening a practice was going to be very successful for me. Um, I know some recommendations since you're going in is, um, you're, I'm assuming you're buying a, a, an existing practice. Having that transition, uh, having somebody help you with that transition is going to be really important. All my friends who bought existing all had consultants and it was so much easier to transition for them to do that. And they all hit the marketing really well in the um, existing team had to be on board with that big time. So that's going to be a big part is having the existing team members on board with any type of transition, because if they're not, then it may not be as smoothly as may not go as smoothly as you want, but there's so much to go. Cause I'm like, you could talk about team members. You can talk about marketing. You could talk about business. You could talk about so much stuff. Um, consultants great because they were, she was fantastic. She, cause she gave you like lists and folders of these are things you want to address and these are things you want to do. I had a board just to help me with questions and decisions. Um, having a really close network of people that you can go to to ask questions is going to be invaluable to you. And like I said, having a team behind you and supportive is going to be a really big thing as well, especially with patients if you're buying an existing practice because that transition of going from one doctor to another is going to be hard for them because as much as people don't think it, a dentist is a very personal relationship. It's like a hairdresser. Yeah. For yeah. oh, sure. Um, I have another question, and I think, um, Melissa, this one might be geared towards you. Um, what if corporate dentistry forces you to make a certain amount per day, per week, per year, I, I guess, the, like pressure to produce? Um, that's the question. I'm not sure if there's like a what if and then like a consequence, but have you ever dealt with that? And how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, we had, um, I wouldn't say we had firm numbers or quotas, um, and I certainly don't face that now where I'm at. Um, I, and I think some owner doctors uh, would put those same um, conditions on their associates. So it's not necessarily a problem that's confined to corporate, um, but I, corporate definitely has that 
um, reputation, if you will. Uh, I, I I think it just depends on what those requirements are and how um, you know the the doctor feels about meeting those. Is it something that they're on board with? You know, is it um, let's say a national sealant um, you know quota goal or requirement? Uh, and so you're you know in a public health sense supporting the sealant, um, or is it you know you have to produce a certain number of dollars and where it's really just money driven? I think that plays a big part. Um, and your personal ethics as a dentist as well. Great. Um, another doctor asked, would you recommend partnership? Anyone have a partner? I have. Yeah, one. I think that's tough. <laughs> it's hard. I think that's tough. Do yeah, you, it's really tough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I had one. I had one in the past. Um, and we're still very good friends. Um, she was actually one of my classmates and we did that for about five years. And I can tell you in doing, um, a, opening a business as a partnership from scratch and opening it as a solo owner from scratch, solo owner is way easier. 100%. Yeah, way easier. <laughs> but partnership gives you that person to lean on. And at first, when you're really inexperienced in business, I think maybe that's when um, you need that moral support and it feels good to have someone else um, kind of high five you on decisions and stuff. Later on, once you become a little bit more confident, um, it kind of slows you down to have to make decisions with another human all the time. And if you're married, just think about it. It's like you're married at home and then you're also married at work and you're always compromising. And, you know, sometimes it's good to just be the boss and just get to. Yeah. And that was my life. And so I never got away from work. And then when it falls apart, then you're, you're left with a big mess. So don't do the married partner thing. Yeah. That, I think a lot of people say that. Um, Dr. Aline also asked, have you ever rene renegotiated your contract as an associate or had an associate renegotiate their contract with you? And what did, what did it entail? How did you feel being an associate asking to renegotiate and as an owner being asked to renegotiate? I think there's nothing wrong with it if, it, if you give it enough time that it's realistic. If they're coming to me in six to eight weeks, no. If they're coming to me after a year, I can live with that. So yeah. I think that's a fair question, but you've got to give it time. I've heard of people trying to change their deal halfway through. No, that's that's a big no. Anybody else? I think that um, if you know your uh, what it you know your priorities like um, so it's maybe it's not just financial but it's uh, benefits or it's retirement uh, it's health insurance I think having um, having goals laid out and defined is uh, valuable and then also being able to support this potentially increased um, cost on the owner you know I've brought in X or whatever um, so having that as a give and take you know uh, um, can be helpful too. I also wanted to add, this kind of brings back memories of when I was an associate like 15 years ago, um, I had many, you know, different associateships and private practices, some where I had contracts and some that I didn't. And I always felt back then as an associate that um, contracts were kind of one-sided. And then I started to learn my lesson where the office where I did not have a contract, she, the owner, kept changing my payment without telling me. So one month I would get a different percent collection, and then the next month I'm not getting collections on radiographs. And then I would go to the office manager and I'd say, why is it that I'm, I didn't get my percent of collections on diagnosing radiographs this month? Oh, the owner changed your mind. Well, I had nothing in contract to protect myself as an associate. And so I learned my lesson there that contracts are set in place to protect both parties and is there for a reason. Um, and some associates are like, hey, I don't have an associate, woohoo, or not associate, a contract. I, like, that's great for me. But I, I, I really, really think that um, you should consider having something in writing, especially when it has something to do with your compensation. So that was my experience. 
Yeah, I think definitely contracts, they're helpful for both sides. But obviously, as an owner, you have more power in the contract situation. But the associates, they have to be looking for what they need to to protect themselves. Right. And I think it, if you have an amicable relationship, there can be a give and take on both sides and come to an agreement on what's fair for both parties. Um, Rebecca Stamler asked, I'm not sure if you're going to address this, but if you're not buying the practice you are currently working on or in, what would you say are your first steps to getting started in purchasing a practice? Decide where you want to be, where you want to live and something in proximity of that um, location. And I don't mean real, like location, 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 like real estate, because that's what they teach us in school, right? But the reality is you can go open in old established neighborhoods where there's already dentists, that's the truth. But if it's close in proximity to your home and that's where you want to live, then that's where you're going to be the most comfortable. So find somewhere that's somewhere that you want to be. That's, that's kind of your step one. And then go, go from there and see what's available. Anybody purchase a practice? I have purchased a practice. I would say um, to really understand demographics, you have to kind of teach yourself that. And you want to also, I, I think one of the biggest problems a lot of people are making is their opening. I think it's great to decide you wanna, where you wanna be, but if you open in a saturated area, it's gonna be a much bigger uphill battle than if you open up a little bit further away from that saturated area where there's a lot more people um, I don't think a lot of people know even how to look. How many dentists are in this area and how, what's the population of this area? Those kind of ratios and things like that. I mean, that's something you can get every bit of that information for free on the internet. You just have to know to look for it. Right. And I think a consultant can also help with that. Um, and Kim Phelps asks, how does someone find a consultant? And um, I don't know if any of you have worked with consultants. I know Leslie and I have. Anybody else. I've, I've, I've worked with several consultants over the years, depending on what I needed. Right. I mean, there's different consultants that do different things and different places in your career, you have different needs. Right. So I think the best thing is to ask around. You can probably get four or five names and talk to each one of them and, and interview them and see what's the good fit. I, I turned down just as many consultants as I hired. So um, you just really have to find someone that seems to be that you can gel with. Right. And like you said, can um, really help you with what your current needs are. I think yes. that is really important to note because like you said, there's so many different consultants that do different things. And de depending on where you are in your career, one consultant may be a better fit. Um, yes. Jay, yeah. Jay Shri, Dr. Jay Shri said, asked, I have been an associate for six years and have helped our practice to double. He promised me partnership and total ownership that keeps increasing the price and wants a royalty after the purchase price. What do you think of royalties on top of the purchase price? No. I've never even heard of it. <laughs> no, no, no. No. N-O. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll address your question before the royalties because I might be going through this with the practice I associate at. and. Um, there's what you need to do is you need to get into a contract now so what you need to do is you both need to meet with an attorney and if this is something that's going to go to um partnership and then full ownership you need to set the terms now before you grow the practice anymore so you need to set a price of purchase a price like all of that now so that if you continue to grow the practice he can't raise the purchase price so um that that's important that needs to be done now before you make this an even better practice because you're only screwing yourself um i know it sounds bad but it's true you because if you don't have anything in writing you you don't have any a leg to stand on so we have a very successful practice in the associateship that i'm in and um it's a great practice but we need to set the terms now if i'm going to become a partner um in the next even if it's five years down the road, only because his ortho that's retiring 
receiving and he has a very small bit in the practice, he's bringing in a new ortho and that's going to boom the practice and it's going to make the production go through the roof. So by then, the value of his practice is going to go through the roof once this new orthodontist comes in and increases the value of the practice for the owners. So we need to settle on a purchase price now. So we've already had the practice evaluated and we've had all that done. And then we're meeting with an attorney and we're going through all the documents. So that's all things that we're doing now before this new orthodontist comes in and the value of the practice goes up. Otherwise, if you don't negotiate that now, you don't have a leg to stand on if there's nothing in writing and no legal document. So. Correct. Very, very good, Leslie. Um, number, I, I'm gonna go back to this list of questions that we had originally, you know, we're going off of, but all these um, attendees had really great questions. Um, I was going to ask all of you, what tips do you have for successful contract negotiations? Since we were talking about contracts um, between an owner and associate, like I know it can get a little awkward, but I know that like whenever I hand someone a contract, they're always going to ask about restrictive covenant. They're going to ask about um, lab fees. You know, what are some things that you guys run into um, that you got, you may kind of butt heads on and how do you kind of smooth that out, especially if you really like that person and you want them to join your team? One thing I learned early on is that you really need to offer a nice, well-rounded package if you want to attract a good associate. And as an associate, you should look for a nice, well-rounded package. There should be a, you know, not just, oh, you get 30% and 30 and you pay 30% of lab. That's not going to be a good long-term job. It might be a good starting job, but it's not going to be a good long-term job. And so if you also, um, as an owner, you know, you put it out there and you say, hey, I'm, 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 I'd like your opinion on this. If, if there's anything you're not comfortable with, talk to me about it and then start the dialogue. Because I think associates, especially when they're right out of school, they're very nervous and you need to give them permission to talk to you about it so that um, there can be um, a, a nice dialogue. Definitely. Um, do you feel like, speaking of associates, what are some good questions to ask an associate when they come for an interview? And where do you find them? So this is a three-part question. So where do you find them? What are the interview questions? And how do you know if you and your practice is ready for one? I am going to just answer one part of it, um, which is a real, what's a really good interview question. I have an absolute favorite interview question. Everything else I think is fluff around my favorite interview question. <laughs> and I hope that nobody that I'm interviewing in the future gets the answers right now. <laughs> but my, my really important interview question is this. When I'm hiring an associate, they're, they're at least going to be working with me. I'm sure that's the case for most people hiring an associate. But in my practice, they're working with other GPs and other specialists. We're a pretty big team. So the most important thing to me is team alignment as a team of doctors. So my really great question is, what? it's a situation. What would you do if you got a patient in your chair, treatment planned for uh, a DO on a premolar, and you look at the x-ray and you're like, uh... I don't really see a DO. <laughs> what do you do? And I mean, the range of answers, you guys. And for me, I'll tell you, this is a deal breaker question. If they screw up this answer, they do not get the job if they have a perfect profile in every other situation, in every other question of the interview, and if they have a perfect resume. Because that's, you want somebody that's going to be in your practice, who's got a great bedside manner, who's going to, especially if doctors are working at the same time, who has a common sense to just go ask the doctor who treatment planned it, for example. But like I say, hashtag common sense, not so common. <laughs> so you really need to ask a question in your interviews. So that's, that's my favorite interview question. Okay, so if I said, um, I wouldn't do it, then I wouldn't get the job. No, just <laughs> no I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that you have to do something that you're not comfortable doing. But my big thing is, find out really what's going on. Like, for example, you know, there's different types of x-rays um, with different maybe resolutions. You know that it takes someone going from um, digital x-rays or even analog x-rays into a phosphor plate system is not used to being able to diagnose 
when you can't see as well because it's a little bit fuzzier. Whereas I've seen associates diagnose something that they say it's indentin. Somebody goes in there, drills it, and is like, yeah, it's indentin, but in the x-ray, you, you don't even see it going through the enamel. It kind of depends what you're looking at. So never do anything that you're uncomfortable doing. That's not totally what I'm saying. What I'm saying is just be, a, be, be able to have that open dialogue with the doctors because we really are a team. And if you expect as an associate to come in, everybody wants a busy schedule, right? Like if you want to come in and you want a busy schedule, it's only reasonable that you're not shooting down the treatment that's happening because it was planned by somebody else, right? So um, I think just being able to communicate with the other docs and say, hey, what's the background on this? Or I'm not really seeing this. Or maybe just choose a different tooth and don't say anything to the patient and book back with the original doctor that did the treatment plan for whatever you're questioning. That's, that's kind of what I'm looking for. That's the answer. That's the gold star. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other questions, now I forgot what the other questions were. <laughs> It was a three-part question, and I think one was, "Where do you find, where do you find a good associate?" I found my best associate through a corporate headhunter. By far the best associate I had, but I paid fourteen thousand dollars to hire that associate. Wow. So I don't, um, with regards to me and my associates, one of them was word of mouth, and she covered maternity leave for a really good friend of mine. And that's how I found one of them. And my other one, I hate the emails, you know, when we're specialists. So at the, when residency is ending, we receive massive amounts of emails with, here's my resume. I want a job. I don't read any of them. Um, I need some more effort. <laughs> Mine literally was in school in Yale and flew over here to California because that's where I'm at. And she, they, she didn't know I was in the office. It was a non-doctor day and my front desk was there and my door was cracked and my office by the front. And she walked in and she handed her resume in a beautiful envelope, had a great conversation with my front desk and was really sweet and great, wonderful personality and didn't know I was here. She set up an appointment to meet with me. Is there a way I can talk to you, Dr. Butler? Da, da, da. And they said, well, you know, she might be available. So let me, um, you know, I'll reach out to her and then she'll contact you. Went through a resume. And to me, that took a lot of initiative for her to walk into my practice in person, bring her resume. She had a great personality. My front desk loved her, said, oh my gosh, she was great. And I was able to listen to their whole interaction. And to me, that already, I, I didn't even have to read the paperwork to know that she had a really great personality. She would probably be a good fit in my office. Then I read the paperwork and was like, wow, okay, she looks great on paper. So let's now talk to her in person. And that's kind of how I found my other one. And I just love that she took the initiative. It wasn't something that was done by email and it wasn't done, you know, just, oh, I'm going to send out a bulk email to all these people and hopefully somebody will bite. Um, and she's been, she's been wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Both of them have. I actually love both of my associates and they've been amazing. You're, yes, that's great. It's hard to find a good associate. And when you do, um, you know, you want to hold on to them because that relationship is really special. Um, the third question or part of the question was, how do you know if your practice is ready for an associate or that you are ready for an associate? Okay, I'll answer mine. <laughs> I'll answer the question. Um, so for me, I knew that I was ready for an associate when um, I was feeling like I couldn't work every day by myself anymore. There were just too many patients. So that was number one for me, was that when I grew to the point where I was like, I can't work six days, nor do I want to. Um, who's gonna see all these patients? And that was for me, it you know got like, for pedo, it was a thousand patients. Like I had a thousand pedo patients about, and I was like, okay, I'm ready for an associate so that I could cut back. And I think that like, um, there was multiple reasons why you may want an associate, it could be for health, health reasons that you want to cut back. It could be because you have too many patients or it just could be that you are ready to kind of share the patient load type of thing. But that one, that was for me when I knew it was just that I couldn't see all the patients by myself anymore. I do think a red flag for associates that are looking for jobs is 
either the owner dentist has to either have a separate location that you can staff or the owner dentist wants to cut back or the third option is if the owner dentist have several weeks of treatment out there on the books and i'm talking a month to two months of treatment out on the books because i think too many people want an associate but they're not willing to cut back or they don't have enough patience and that's where a lot of these associates get burned because they are working on production and in in these cases at least they know what to look for is is the is the dentist cutting back do they have a second location or do they have several weeks of treatment that's just sitting out there not not unscheduled treatment we're talking about people waiting to be seen that are on the books very very true um I know that like you, we had scheduled an hour, so I just wanted to respect everyone's time and we're getting to about eight minutes. Um, is there anything that you guys think we need to cover for the panelists? I do, I would like to make one comment about owners wondering about bringing in an associate. And that is there's three types of situations you're gonna have with an associate. You're gonna make money, you're going to break even or you're going to lose money so only one of those situations you're making money two out of three you're going to break even or lose money so be very careful when you're deciding if you need an associate how you're going to be affected financially very true and that's something that you would have to know by really knowing your numbers and your practice numbers and your accountant too if you're not sure just to go and make sure that you can support that your practice could support two doctors. And, um, you know, one thing that I thought uh, somebody had asked in an open question, let me just open up this window, um, is Dr. Nadas, somebody asked, is 25% on production good for an associate being in practice for two years, managing the clinic independently? Does anybody say yes to that? Is 25, you're saying getting paid 25% of production? I so think it's not good. It's <laughs> yes. 25% on production, good for an associate being in practice for two years and managing the clinic independently. No, that's terrible. I mean, I think if you're going to manage a clinic independently, you need to be paid a management fee. That's just my personal opinion. And I'm an owner, so I know that would cost me money if I asked somebody to do something like that. Right. Um, 25% on production, a well-run practice should have almost no discrepancy between production and collection. So don't think that just because it's on production that you're making more, it might mean that it's not so well-run. I mean, I, I pay my associates 40%. That's why people work, everything is fair, and that's why they stay. And I don't expect management with that. Can I have a job? <laughs> sure. I'm always, I'm always hiring. And I don't make 40%. I'll open a clinic for you. Like, I never say no. <laughs> um, that's funny. I also wanted to add, you know, um, everyone runs their practices differently and everyone's practice has a different personality. And so my um, recommendation for associates that are going in and interviewing is that you you know, just have the mindset that the doctor may be interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. And you're also interviewing the team, like the office, like you have to go there to work. Is it somewhere you want to go every day? Or is it somewhere that you feel comfortable in, in your own working environment? Um, so I think that for associates, you should really not be like desperate for a job. I mean, unless you really are desperate for a job and you're like willing to take anything <laughs> because you don't want to starve and eat SpaghettiOs, then yeah, go for it. Um, but, you know, I think that you should, associates should really look at long term, like being there at the office long term having a good relationship with patients, having a good relationship with the owner. Um, and for me, I really want that in my office. Like I want associates that are gonna stay with me and be like part of the Yummy Dental family. Um, so I know that that's important to me. I don't know about you guys, but um, if there's any other um, advice, pieces of advice on, for associates looking for jobs, what would you recommend? 
Um, I think if you're looking for a job, and I don't know if this is different for ortho or not, but um, I went through um, our local, you know, dental and um, our local ortho chapter. Um, you know, I mean, I think that there are positions that will be listed there. Um, so maybe check that out first. Um, and then um, I got two positions through, you know, orthodontic reps because they're networking with the doctors. They know who needs someone and they also kind of get a sense for who you might be as a resident. Maybe if you're a good fit for that practice, they're certainly not going to recommend you if you don't seem to be a good fit for um, their uh, client. So I think that that can be an option as well. Uh, that's a good tip. And I just want to throw out there that these reps, they do pay attention to you and they pay attention to your personality. Like a lot of doctors will like poo poo reps and poo poo sales people and just kick them out of their office but uh, the dental community is small so you really want to even if it, they're not dentists or doctors um, anyone in the industry can really um, you just don't want to burn any bridges like you, you want to have good relationships with people in the dental industry because word does get around uh, Kim dr. Kim um, asks for those of you doctors that are owners and associates um, how do you split up your time? Like how many days are you in your own practice versus in the um, practice as an associate? Schedule is crazy. But um, what I've always done is I take my associate position because I average four to five days a month there. So what we do is we schedule um, out six to 12 months in advance. Now it sounds crazy, but we're planners. So um, then what I do is I actually take my schedule based around his. So then I put in a minimum of three days a week in my practice. And then the new practice that just opened, um, I am there on the other day. So um, one of my associates also floats the new practice, but I balance. So on average, about three days a week in my main practice and one day a week at the other two practices. So about five days a week as of right now. Busy. <clears throat> I'm doing six days a week. I am two days in my own startup and then the other days um, I'm an associate and that's just what I got to do at the current stage that I'm in. It's just all about hustle. So um, it gets tough from time to time, but this is kind of what it takes at the moment in my current situation. I think we were all in that situation. I was a startup with it too. Yeah, it's just kind of what you got to do. Definitely. I put my schedule in uh, on the in the chat, but um, basically three days a week in my practice. If it's a holiday week, if there's a no school day, then I'll definitely work that day in my practice. And then five or six a month in corporate, which leaves me one to two days of free time a month. And even though um, I, you know, I'm not necessarily in the hustle, I've sort of committed to doing that as long as it's still enjoyable for me and or my kids are out of college. <laughs> 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 or dental school. <laughs> um, Dr. Carrie Lee wants to ask Dr. Nada, what is a reasonable fee, like management fee? Oh, I have seen this structured in so many ways, depending, I think, on what the person is doing. I've seen it from like a few hundred dollars a month to getting into a few thousand to a percentage of the increase in collections. So I think it depends on where you are and what else is happening in your area. Um, oh, yeah, no, that's so true. Uh, that's, I think that's fair. If, if the doctor is gonna be managing and as an associate, I think definitely that's fair. Um, I cannot believe that this hour has gone by so fast. It's nine o'clock in Central in different time zones for everybody. So I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, um, for being a part of the panel and sharing all of your uh, wisdom and knowledge with all of our attendees. And um, have a happy new year. And we will see you guys in the Facebook group. Have a great night. And if there's any last parting words, please... I do so now. I want to go work for Dr. Nada. <laughs> <laughs>
if you do that, I'm going to retire. We're all moving to Canada. <laughs> Actually, I'm on an island right now. Why don't I try to open something here and we all move down here? Hey, I'm with that. Good idea. I want the management fee. <laughs> if you run it on your own, you can have it. As long as I don't call you, right? Just don't bother me ever. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. All right. Well, I'll have a yummy dental family. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just, you know, I'll bring the treats. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.